If you haven't done so yet, make sure you pause the video and reread the problem before listening on. What we're going to be able to do to calculate the speed of the center of gravity when the rod reaches its lowest position is use the conservation of mechanical energy. This principle tells us that the total final energy is going to equal the total initial energy. So let's go ahead and look at the initial position of the rod. The rod is located in this horizontal position initially. What we'll do is define a reference horizontal level here or a horizontal line. That reference line is going to serve as our baseline height. So in other words, that line represents a height of zero meters. So with that reference line, we can see that the, that the rod would initially have some gravitational potential energy because its center of gravity is located some distance above that reference height. It's almost as though you're lifting an object above a ground level. And when you do that, it has gravitational potential energy. Now, hopefully we know that gravitational potential energy is equal to the mass times the gravitational constant times some height. And as far as the height is concerned, we just need to ask ourselves, what is that initial height of the center of gravity above our reference line? Hopefully we can see that that initial height is L divided by two. So we're going to make a little substitution there where we replace the height with L divided by two. We can actually divide this entire side by two. So there's our initial energy. And then the rod is released from rest. So there's no kinetic energy and it swings down to that lower position. And now it's moving. So now the rod is going to have have kinetic energy and in particular it's going to have rotational kinetic energy because the rod is pivoted to this point O here so it's going to end up with rotational kinetic energy but if you look at the center of gravity that's now located at that height of zero so there's no longer any gravitational potential energy it only has that rotational kinetic energy now rotational kinetic energy is equal to one half times the moment of inertia of the rod times its angular speed squared what we need next is an expression for the rotational inertia of the rod and in this chapter, we have learned that for a long rod with a rotation axis through its end, then the rotational inertia or moment of inertia is given by that expression right there. So for this I, we're going to make that substitution. We're going to fill in one third times the mass of the rod times its length squared. And then we still have the omega squared on this side. Now, what we'll do is we'll try to isolate that angular speed, that omega. And if we look carefully, the mass appears on both sides. So if we divided both sides of the equation by mass, the mass would cancel. We can see on the left side, we have one half times one third. So we have one sixth, and then that's L squared times omega squared. Let's multiply both sides of the equation by six so that we can cancel the one sixth on the, right hand, or on the left hand side. On the right hand side, you have six divided by two. So we can write that as three GL. Let us divide both sides of this by L squared to cancel that term on the left hand side. On the right hand side, we can cancel a factor of L. So we would be left with three G all over L. And then finally, taking the square root of both sides, we can see that the angular speed is equal to the square root of three times G divided by L. Now the question doesn't want angular speed. It wants a translational speed. And there's a nice relationship between translational speed and angular speed. What we do is we multiply the angular speed by a radius value. Now, as far as the radius value is concerned, we go back up to the picture and that radius is simply measured from the location of the center of gravity to the rotational axis. So this distance right here would represent R and we can see from the picture that R is equal to L divided by two. So we'll come back down here and for that R in our equation, we will substitute in L divided by two. And then for omega, we have that square root of 3g over l. Now that would be an acceptable answer, but we're going to clean it up just a little bit to make it look slightly more attractive. And to do that, we'll take l divided by 2 and we'll do a little bit of an algebraic trick. What we'll do is first artificially square it, and then to undo the squaring, take the square root. And that might seem like hocus pocus, but what that does is it creates two radicals that are being multiplied together. And when you have two radicals that are multiplied together, you can actually take the square root of the product of those two quantities. So in other words, we're going to bring the L over 2 squared underneath this giant radical along with the 3G over L. Now we can square that L divided by 2 to give us an L squared over 4. We can then f cancel a factor of L. So now we have the following. 
And that too would be acceptable. We'll do just a little more touch up. We'll take the square root of the numerator and denominator separately. And the only reason to do that is because the denominator has a perfect square in it. So when we take the square root of that denominator, we end up with a nice whole number of two. So this would be the final answer to part A of the question. This is the speed of the center of gravity once the rod reaches that lower point. Now there is a part B to this question and in part B we are asked to find the tangential speed of the lowest point on the rod. Now the lowest point of course is going to have a different value of r. Let's take a look at that. Here's the lowest point of the rod. It's moving with the same angular speed. It's very important to understand that whatever the angular speed of the center of gravity was is the same angular speed as the lower point. But again what differs is the value of r. So we're going to measure r from the lowest end of the rod up to that pivot point up there. That would encompass the entire length of the rod. So in other words r is going to equal L in that case. So moving all the way down here for part B, we can still say that the speed is equal to R times omega, but again for R we're going to now use L rather than L divided by 2, and then omega is the same as it was before. So we've made that substitution for omega, and now we'll do our little trick here to create two radicals. Take the L, artificially square it, and then take the square root. That maintains its original value. Now we have two square roots that are being multiplied together, so we can sort of condense them into one square root of a product. So we would have 3g times L squared all over L. A factor of L cancels in the numerator and denominator, and we end up with the square root of 3GL. This is the correct answer to part B. We might notice an interesting relationship between the two. Remember that in part A we had found that the speed of the center of mass or the center of gravity was the square root of 3GL over 2. Now we have a speed of the lower end. We might just say V sub L to make the lower end more apparent. That you'll notice is actually twice as big as the speed of the center of gravity. So another way of expressing the speed of the lower end of the rod would be to say that it is twice the speed of the rod's center of gravity. So that would be another way of expressing the answer to part B.